Hello, dear friends. I'm Samuel Moore, and welcome to Talking Music, the show where you get to enjoy long-form discussions with superb and fascinating musicians. My brilliant guest today is the classical guitarist and composer, Laura Snowden. Laura, welcome to Talking Music. Hello, thank you for having me. Pleasure is all mine, Laura. Thank you for being here. Now, Laura, I think it's fair to say that most people following this are likely already familiar with both you and your work. But for those who aren't, perhaps you could start by giving us a brief overview of who you are and what's been your journey through life that has led you to be sitting here today. Um, I'm a guitarist and composer. Um, I guess most of the work I've done has tended to be within classical and folk fields. Um, these days, I'm sort of doing a mixture of things in my concert programs. Um, I'm kind of playing some quite traditional classical guitar music then I'm playing my own compositions and I'm playing some folk music and uh, singing folk songs as well. And then I'm sort of using my voice in various ways in my compositions as well. So it's quite a, a mixture of stuff that I'm doing at the moment in my solo stuff. And then I also work on pieces for other people, like I write commissions for other musicians. Um, what was the second part of the question? The journey to getting here. <laughs> Um, mm, well, uh, I started playing the classical guitar because um, I was so upset that the Spice Girls had broken up that I just felt there was no, nothing left for me really in classical music, uh, in pop music rather after that. So I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll just have to do classical then. Um, so yeah, because I, I went to a rather traumatic disco when I was in year five and I didn't understand the music. And it was just all very stressful. So I decided to uh, play classical guitar instead. Um, but then I think when I was growing up, it was just a very creative kind of atmosphere for me. Um, I think my parents are both very creative, but also my grandmothers are both really creative. My, I have a French grandma who makes these amazing jumpers, sweaters, as they call them in the US. And um, my English grandma, she, we used to do lots of activities together, like poetry reading art we used to go to the beach and then collect uh these big kind of stones that were dragon's eggs and then we would take them home leave them outside and wait for them to hatch so it was just quite a creative sort of time um so i, I wasn't particularly planning on going into music uh but i knew i wanted to be involved in creativity and i actually remember lying in my bunk bed sometimes and if I was feeling sad, I would just think, at least you still have creativity. So that was something that was really important to me from a young age. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to um, be involved in um, creating, but I, I was quite into performance as well and the feeling of performing. Um, but then I think when I was uh, 16 or 15 rather i um was reading the latest copy of classical guitar magazine as you do and um it said that there had been a donation from the rolling stones to the yehudi menuhin school which is a specialist music school um for guitar tuition so um i decided to audition and so i ended up going there with a scholarship for essentially like the sixth form years um so that was kind of a little bit random in a way, because I think if I hadn't gone there and that hadn't happened, I may have gone into a different field, but it just happened. And then, yeah, from there, I went to the Royal College of Music and sort of ended up going into this whole thing. So I think that's a general summary. Well, that's a wonderfully succinct version of your musical journey. Thank you for sharing it with us. And before I go into my first question, I must ask, you mentioned your grandma makes wonderful jumpers. Are those the ones that often feature in your YouTube performance videos? Yeah, they often do, yeah. <laughs> I've always been a big fan of those, so now I know where they come from. Thanks. Oh, yay, that's great. Okay, she will be happy to hear that. Well, I may need to provide a translation, but she will be happy to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. Well, there's so much you've spoken of that I'd like to go into in more detail, but I think a really interesting place to start might be this. You mentioned that other musics other than classical music 
have played a role in shaping your musical journey. I'd love to know a little bit more about how that came to be. And crucially, most people know you as a classical guitarist. So how have those experiences influenced the way you approach the classical guitar? Um, well, I think when I was uh, little, my dad was playing the Irish tenor bandro and he was playing Irish music on it. He's gone through various different stages of, with his music. It, he, it's not his job, but he's very good. And he's gone through different stages of uh, playing different styles, um, usually on, yeah, on string-based instruments, so guitar, mandolin, banjo. Um, and so at the time he was doing Irish music on the banjo. So I suppose that was kind of the earliest music that I probably heard in the home, at least live. Um, I wouldn't have been going to concerts or anything. So I, that would have been the music that I had heard actually played in real life. And he also had two people, two men that he sang with in a trio where they sang in harmonies. Um, and then I think we did go to a few folk festivals and things when I was a bit older and I saw um, some, yeah, especially traditional Irish musicians. Um, but then I think I was a little bit against the whole thing because I was like trying to be cool and different from my dad. <laughs> and so, uh, but when, but then when I went to uh, the menu in school and then I was away from home, then suddenly I was feeling quite nostalgic about it all and uh, I wanted to do it then. Um, and so I think then when I went to the Royal College of Music, I had this uh, week where I was thinking, say yes to everything for one week. And then during that week, um, an advert came up in the college bulletin saying that um, a person called Rory Glasheen was looking for people to play folk music with. And so I went along to that. And that was the beginning of us creating a folk group called Tyrolis. So then I ended up um, playing in that group for uh, quite a long time. So I think that was the beginning of the whole thing. And it, if anything, I feel that because um, I don't really feel that the classical music was part of my original roots necessarily in terms of what I was hearing at home. And my dad really liked Ralph McTell at the time, I think. So he was listening to a lot of Ralph McTell and I remember really liking him. And I just thought I really liked the guitar playing. I thought he had a beautiful voice and um, I still do. I'm still a big fan. I also just like the fact that not all the songs are about romance. They're about quite a wide variety of different things. So I find romance quite boring. I, I couldn't take maybe like five percent of romance, but I don't I don't feel that it needs to be so much romance based content because there's a lot of other interesting things out there. So so yeah, I just really liked him. Um, so yeah, I think that was where it all came from, really. And the second part of the question was relating to how has that shaped you in terms of the way you approach and play classical mm. music? Has it influenced you in, in that way more specifically in terms of the way you deliver your concerts? I think so. I think in terms of general musicianship, it's kind of hard to say how things happen or where things come from, maybe. But I think um, when I was with the band and we were playing in we were kind of playing, I suppose, on a kind of indie singer songwriter scene in London. So different um, kind of clubs that hosted uh, nights where you would have three or four acts, let's say, and quite a few of them would be singer songwriters. And um, I suppose just the presentation that they had was very different from in a classical concert because it was just a lot more personal, I think, and informal, a lot more explanation of why I've written this song, why I'm playing this, uh, sort of personal stories about maybe just something funny that's happened that day, something that happened to you on the way to the gig. It was a lot more um, human in a way, and that's not to say that the classical recitals aren't, it, 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 it just, and, and obviously I know people present their classical recitals in lots of different ways, so there are musicians who do deliver it in that way. But maybe some of the things I'd seen had been more um, formally presented, which has its own uh, cool effects. That's uh, maybe a lot more dramatic, walking on stage and not saying anything and presenting each piece. And that has a kind of magic to it in its own way. Um, but just for me personally, I enjoyed that sense of intimacy and um, very personal connection. So I think that was something that then I wanted to bring into the 
the presentation in the classical concerts. That's very interesting. I'd like to stick with talking about your musical journey for a little bit longer, if I may, Laura. You alluded to your musical education in your initial outline, and I'd like to pivot to that direction a little bit. I think everybody watching and listening will be able to relate to what I'm about to describe. We've all had these experiences, whether we're at school, college, university, where a tutor says something to us and we kind of lock it away. We, we think that's a keeper. And it kind of becomes a talisman. Uh, without wishing to mix my metaphors, it kind of becomes in time a compass that points us north through much of our later life. I've certainly had those experiences. I imagine most people listening have, and I can definitely imagine you have as well. Given that, and given your quite amazing musical education, what would you say is the best single piece of advice you've ever been given by either a tutor or somebody you really admire? Hmm. Oh, I always get very stressed with single piece of advice questions. Um, <laughs> single, like it's like when someone says, what's your favorite film you've ever seen? And I get really stressed. Um, I'll, I'll, well, let, I'll let you have two if you're really <laughs> Oh, okay, <that>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's hard because in a funny kind of way, I feel that the things that I've learned kind of deeply, often the people teach them to you, not through a piece of advice, but in um, just their own way of being and their whole attitude. And it's something you kind of learn by osmosis over time. And also the things that I feel that I've really deeply learned are kind of embodied and encoded into me now. So it's like, in a way, if I'm still thinking of the advice, that's the stuff that I feel that I haven't really learned that I'm trying to remember that the stuff that is um, uh, just kind of have become has become a part of me. I don't think I remember what was said. Does that make sense? <laughs> That makes perfect sense. And I know what you mean. You, you often, the best piece of advice are often the things where the person giving it is kind of leading by example. They're kind of showing you the way without expressly telling you to do it that way. Exactly. Yeah. I often think of this with um, my, at Royal College of Music, I had this really fantastic Alexander Technique teacher called Judith Kleinman. She's really brilliant. And I often think about, um, I think her way of teaching is, it's so embodied and the things that she's, I don't even know if she's advising or telling you to do things. I suppose she is advising, but she's doing it in such a mindful and kind of gentle way and seems to be doing them herself too, that it, you don't feel like it's advice or instructions. Um, Cause I remember she would talk about um, this idea of uh when you're practicing, for example, of just having a curious, interested voice in your head. So it's not a voice that's saying, oh, why did you do that, you stupid idiot? But a voice that's saying, oh, how interesting. Um, oh, I wonder if I can investigate that a little bit more. That's really interesting. So just quite a neutral, curious and compassionate voice. But I think that's how she treated us. She had that voice to us. So she was actually teaching us to speak to ourselves like that because that's what she did. And she gave the impression that that's also how she tries to speak to herself. So I've, I've always found that really admirable with her because she's not saying one thing and doing another bit. It's all very embodied. I know exactly what you're saying there. It, my mind was racing while you were talking because it puts me in mind of, I remember a wonderful workshop I went to when I was doing my undergraduate where they got the singer Roderick Williams to come in and do a masterclass. And I've always loved his singing. So I went to see the workshop, not because I'm a singer and I was taking part, but I just wanted to be in the room. And I came away thinking that was a real masterclass in just how you present yourself. It was done with such poise and dignity and and humanity mm. and and i learned a lot just by observing that um mm. just by how he he lived it in front of everybody so i can really relate to that so thank you for sharing that 
Yeah, that's interesting about that class. I feel like I've seen a couple of classes too where I've felt that I, I often feel there's a guitarist, Pavel Steidel, who I really like. Um, he's just brilliant, but it's again a very he has a very um I think quite beautiful way of teaching and conducting himself. Um one thing I can think that he did say that I, I found really interesting, but it's very simple, but he would talk about the idea that when you're speaking, you don't speak like this all the time. So there's always, uh, it's uneven, the way you speak is uneven on purpose. And so he, he would talk about how when you practice your scales or something, you often practice them trying to make them all even. And you think what you're trying to do is make things even, but actually a lot of the time in music, you're trying to make things uneven. Uh, he said it in a nicer way, but I think that uh, things like that was a bit of a, just a shift in the way of thinking, I suppose. Um, but I think, yeah, he has a really nice way of wh when I've been in classes with him in, in, in a group and seen how he's working with people, he just seems to get something out of people. I mean, it's like a magic, it's sort of their whole body language shifts and their um, just the way they're shaping things, the way they're thinking, their imagination, their creativity seems to come alive. And you can kind of see the sparkle in everybody's eyes. And that's not coming through a piece of advice, but it's just coming through. I don't know what it is. It's a kind of magic. Um, and so I feel, yeah, when I've had some classes with him or been around him that it's affected my whole attitude, but not in any way that I can actually pinpoint. Well, I think that's wonderful. And we've touched on some really deep things there. So thank you for having that aspect of the conversation. I'm going to ask a follow up, if I may, Laura. I'd never forgive myself if I didn't ask what I'm about to ask. In addition to your formal education at institutions for music, you were also one of the last one-to-one -one students of the great classical guitar maestro, Julian Breen. Pretty much everybody watching and listening to this will know who Julian Breen was and will doubtless have an immense respect for his artistry and legacy. I'm aware this is a very personal thing to have to answer, but would you mind sharing with us some of your favorite memories of your time with Julian and how you feel that's helped shape you into the artist you are today. Yeah, I actually genuinely loved having lessons with Julian. I thought he was a really brilliant teacher. And um, people sometimes ask me, was it similar to the masterclasses that you can see on BBC? Because I, the BBC had filmed masterclasses with him when he was much younger. Um, and it kind of wasn't really that similar to that. I suppose that was maybe a more uh, maybe, maybe just different phase of his life, but also a more public facing, maybe have to make everything a little bit more official or whatever. But um, to be honest, it just felt like uh, we would go through pieces in great detail. We could be there for hours um, and just really work through in great detail. And it was really just looking at sort of what is the music trying to do? What's it trying to say? And how can you convey that um and he just had a really yeah he, he he'd sort of he'd give me a lot of suggestions but he'd always give me a reason for every suggestion and the reason was often really quite inspiring and um profound so you hold on to the reason maybe more than the thing itself uh so in that sense, I think that's really good teaching because you're not just learning a set of instructions that you don't really know. OK, I have to go loud here. Why? But I don't know, but I'll do it anyway. But it, you're actually getting a little bit more to the heart of the music itself and uh, what it feels like. But one thing I think he, he helped me to just feel things for myself more, which again is like, how do you teach someone to feel things? I've heard some people say you can't teach people to feel things, which is one way of looking at it. But um, I felt that he did help me to, and he would say, he would often say, you know, when it's right, uh, not like right and wrong, but, but just like, you know, when it feels right. Um, and in a way, encourage me to trust myself more and trust that it would be there. 
Um, but also I think he really taught me so much about making the guitar sing because he would often say, I would play something, uh, say something that's quite melodic and slow, that's got a really beautiful melody, for example. Um, and he would say, it's not singing. And I would be thinking, yeah, it is. I mean, this is pretty much as singing as it can get on the guitar. I mean, the guitar is not really that singing anyway. And this is this is as good as it's going to get, etc. I, I wasn't maybe consciously thinking that, but in the back of my mind, that's probably what I was thinking. Um, and then just him saying it's not singing. In a way, it made me think, oh, OK, so maybe a much higher level of singingness is possible. And to some degree, I think when you're playing a piece of music, uh, if you think that something is possible with that piece of music, that's already the first step, because if you've already thought, well, it can't be any more singing or exciting or characterful or dramatic or whatever than this, because it's a guitar or whatever, then well, it's definitely not going to be. But if you're thinking this is going to be like as singing as the most wonderful singer in the world, even if it's not quite, <laughs> you've still got a higher chance of it being pretty singing and getting close to there because that's what you thought you could achieve in the first place. So it just totally transformed my approach to singingness on the guitar and phrasing in general. I felt he taught me so much about phrasing. Again, I can't say how there's no piece of advice, but it, it really, you know, transformed my um my whole way of, of phrasing, I think. There's some amazing things you talked about there. And I particularly liked how you spoke of how he helped show you that you shouldn't put an upper limit on what you're trying to do with certain things. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you're instantly boxing yourself in. And I think mm -hmm. that's wonderful, wonderful advice. I'd like to ask a little follow up to that, if I may. I'm, I don't know if you find this, but it's often very difficult to assess things objectively when they're you're kind of in the moment of them and you only realize how profound certain bits of advice are when you've had a bit of time to kind of mull over it and experience it in the real world have you found that with your experiences with julian breen yeah i think everything that i've ever learned that was kind of worthwhile hasn't just been like, oh, great, I got that now, woo! Because if it was that easy, I would have probably learned it already, um, <laughs> sadly. Um, it's, so I think it's more, I've always felt that it kind of takes me about a year anyway, just to, for something to really sink in, um, in any way at all. Um, and yes, I think I, I still think of the things that he said and the approach now, and I think it's even affected my composition, for example, um, because I suppose what I also admired with Julian was how much conviction he had in what he was doing and how into it he was, because he was so into music. And when he was retired, obviously, when I was having the lessons with him, but he said that he would just sit for hours on end listening to music now that he was retired because he didn't have to be rushing about all the time, um, which shows a real love for it if you just want to sit there and, and listen to he could have listened to other stuff i guess but he was just choosing to listen to music over, uh, for hours a day and that passion and commitment i guess i was inspired by that and i thought what am i passionate about like that and one of those things is composing and just this very extremely creative uh work that i like to do and so i think that encouraged me to do my thing and be myself more, which is maybe not what you'd expect because when someone has their own very strong conviction, it might make you think, oh, I've got to be like them and do the, the, the thing that they want to, that they're doing because they're so convinced. But I think with time, I just took the conviction part. It was like, yeah, <laughs> and I applied that to my own things, if that makes sense. It certainly does. And you've actually unintentionally led me to exactly where I wanted to go next. I often like to do this on talking music discussions with my guests. I like to embarrass them a, a little bit by offering compliments. <laughs> so let me do this with you because ever since I first became aware of you and your work, it's always struck me that you have quite a strong sense of who you are as an artist. 
to put it really bluntly, Laura, you have an authenticity that runs through everything you do. You're, you're clearly going out each day and trying to be the best version of you rather than trying to impersonate someone else. Now, some people might say, well, isn't that just being an artist? And I suppose the short answer is yes, of course it is. But the more nuanced, longer answer is yes, but that doesn't mean it's easy to do. And the proof of that is the fact that the vast majority of people who claim to be artists never actually achieve that in reality. You have achieved that, and I'd say that's a statement rather than a question. I think we could all learn from you in this regard. So you touched on it a little bit a moment ago, but perhaps you could unpack a little bit more. How has that come to be, Laura? Is it something that you thought quite deeply about and worked on, or did it kind of develop organically over time? Um, I think that's a really nice thing to say, thank you, um, because I, I'm happy that you think that because I do try to <laughs> be authentic in what I'm doing and I don't always feel that I achieve it and I feel that I still have more to do and further to go, but it's nice if you uh, recognise that that is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, I don't know really about it all. Um, it's really strange because I think this is going off on a major tangent. Um, we could come up back to the question. But <laughs> I'm just thinking that it's really weird with classical music because if you're playing a piece that's already been written by somebody else, um, in my opinion, I think you can kind of give an authentic performance of a piece that you don't necessarily like or even sort of originally connect with because I, I see it a bit like if you were an actor and you were asked to be in a film or something and maybe you didn't you didn't actually like the film or the director or it's not the kind of genre that you would actually watch yourself but I think you could still find a sort of sincerity and truth in the character and give a, a fiercely authentic performance in that film despite not actually liking it at all and, and to take the metaphor a little step further, you could, I suppose, an actor can and often does play deeply unpleasant characters they might yeah. like or relate yeah. to, but exactly. they, still, they still deliver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I sort of feel in a way with classical music, it, it, it can be kind of the same. Um, and in any case, even if you loved a piece, you might get a little bored of it after a while or you might not like it in the beginning and grow to like it so it's not as clear cut as i like it i don't like it but just very generally um you could in theory i think give an authentic perf performance of something that you don't personally feel like you want to really get behind but then doing that too much i think creates a kind of cognitive dissonance because you're trying to be so authentic but you're it's like trying to be like this amazing lover to someone you're not in love with or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's really strange. So uh, I think now I am actually trying to choose the repertoire itself and do the things and the actual music itself that I feel more connected with, um, even though I think I can do the other thing, which is authentic, sincere performances of basically anything that I'm given if if needed. Um, but uh, so that's just where I'm at with it at the moment, I think is is becoming more about the actual music. And that's why I'm writing more. That's why I'm singing more, um, arranging more. And I'm but yeah, it's very hard because I, I also feel sometimes quite bound by the um, the genre that I'm in and the expectation uh, of big, just on a practical sense, I feel like, well, if I go and do a concert, and I just do something totally not at all, anything to do with classical guitar, for example, that people might if you think, hey, OK, well, <laughs> that's not really what I paid my money for. Thank you. Um, so I think it's also hard trying to feel the authenticity, but kind of place it in where you actually, yeah. From, I was listening very intently to what you were saying there, and it strikes me that 
to a certain extent, the answer to the question kind of sounds like what you're saying is a big part of it is being willing to give yourself permission to do what you think is right in an established art form that has clear cut rules. And that's not always easy to do. It requires a certain amount of artistic bravery to do that. And you have to be willing to try that. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And it's really funny, actually, because when you're at music college and stuff, they always talk to you about having your uh, USP, your unique selling point or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, must try to be unique. Um, but then the, the hilarious thing is when you actually do have something that that kind of is unique, you're thinking, oh my God, I'm such a weirdo. Why can't I just be normal like all the others? <laughs> so it's actually harder than it seems, I think, to do something a bit different because yeah, that that's when you actually feel, am I doing something wrong? Am I being weird? Um, yeah. But it's, it's also, I think you touched on something quite deep there because it's less about trying to find something unique it's more about embracing something quite deep down in in you as to what you are so it's more an acceptance thing than a finding thing is is that fair absolutely yeah i really highly agree because i think that's again i guess the problem with the usp thing if you took that the wrong way that you go running around trying to find something unique and what i'm saying is more that actually if you really do what is in your heart it might be something that is just inherently a bit unique or different just because you're like you are. So um, it might not be radically different, but it will still be you and your voice. And actually, I think just doing that is hard. There's some really wise stuff there, Laura. Thank you. Wisdom, that. wisdom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We should probably explain for the benefit of the viewers where that joke's come from. Yes, I was explaining to you beforehand that uh, my sister once did a cha chant that went, wisdom, wisdom. I can't remember why. I think it's because someone said something wise. So I'd explained that to you and you'd said, feel free to do the chant at any time. <laughs> and you did, and I thank you for it. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'd like to now give you another compliment, Laura. I've had the pleasure of coming to see a few of your concerts. And one thing that's always struck me about them is you have quite an amazing ability to shape the time and space that you share with your audience. In other words, one of the great joys of seeing you perform, it's not just the playing side of it. It's actually the whole package. It's the atmosphere you create as soon as you walk out onto that stage to when you leave it. Here's the thing. I find many musicians find it hard to do what you do in that respect. And when I talk to many musicians, I often find that they don't find performing a kind of empowering, liberating, exciting experience, they actually find it quite stressful and intimidating. They're, they're, they're the words that you keep hearing again and again. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this, and maybe you could share with us some wisdom on how those who are struggling with this side of their artistry could do better. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, that's really nice. Um, I'm thinking that I can think of a few things that um, I could mention. Um, one of them is that this guitarist, Pavel Steidl, that I really like. I went to his concert in, I don't remember when it was, maybe 2014 or 15 or something, in uh, the Sam Wanamaker Playhouse in Shakespeare's Globe. It's a very beautiful hall. Have you been there? I can't say I have, no, but yeah, I, I will really on your nice. recommendation. Yeah, it's really nice. It's like a small little indoor place in the Globe, and it's got these... Um, candle light, the candles that hang down, it's very intimate and beautiful. But I remember thinking, it just, I, I, I just thought his way of the whole thing, the whole presentation from start to finish, the way he was speaking, the choice of repertoire, everything about it was just so generous and warm and loving and beautiful. And I just thought to myself, I don't think I would want to go to my own concert. So I thought, what, why am I, I think I'm trying to fulfill these certain expectations or things that I think makes a good concert, but I don't think I would want to go to it. Um, so then I started thinking, 
pretty much every day, I really remember doing this, thinking, what are the values that you want to bring to your concerts? What are you actually trying to achieve? So I was thinking generosity, like kindness, empathy, connection, drama, um, feeling, sincerity. And I was really thinking about those things every day and every time I practiced, and it was just in the back of my mind as an intention. And I'm not sure I'd even been clear to myself before then that that was my intention. It's a bit like what we were saying with Julian Bream thing earlier, that if you don't, if you don't even imagine it, then it's definitely not going to happen. So just having that in the back of my mind, I think I found uh, just subconsciously kind of helped because uh, that it helps you then make the right decisions, I guess. Um, but maybe on the more smaller level, um, when you're actually working on a piece of music, I think sometimes it's easy to think that I'll practice it all really well and properly. And then when I'll go on stage, I'll be really free and expressive um, and I'll let go. But I kind of think whatever you do in your practice is what you will do <laughs> when you're on stage. So in the very method of the practice, I try to really always feel like I'm in the moment, I'm living the moment, I'm feeling really open, I'm feeling spontaneous, I'm feeling creative, I'm feeling the emotions afresh each time. And um, yeah, so it's, it's not kind of procedure, but I'm feeling it afresh. And then what I hope is that if I've just only ever practiced like that, pretty much, when I go on stage, it would be weird if I lost all of it. <laughs> even even if I had some kind of epic breakdown and went a bit nuts and lost 30%, then 70% would still be there. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I sometimes think um, when it comes to feeling, I think performance anxiety is obviously a huge and very complex topic and people suffer with it to, in very different ways. And for some people, it's extremely debilitating. And for them, probably little bits of advice like this are a bit patronizing almost because it's it's like well you know everyone has their own unique journey with it i think but just this is just me personally my my way of thinking of it these days is i think of it like as if it's an illness that i just happened to have at the same time as doing my concert so i think if i had to go on stage and i had a temperature and um i don't know i was getting these hot hot and cold flushes because i was ill and maybe I just received some bad news. So I was kind of thinking about weird stuff. That doesn't mean that I lose my entire intention and personality. I still have my you know, empathy. I still have my desire to connect. I still have my emotions. I still have my sense of drama, my sense of timing, my sense of character. I still have those things, even though I'm ill or I've got weird thoughts in my head, they still exist. So in a way, that stuff is irrelevant. It's like, yeah, OK, I'm ill, so what? So that's how I think of it now. I, that might sound a bit quirky, and I don't know if that's advised as a way of thinking of it, but I just think of it almost, that's an irrelevance. That's just something that's there. And what I have to say still exists. I think that's really good advice, actually. I think, I think there's different layers to that that anyone watching and listening can relate to. So thank you for sharing that with us, Laura. I'm now going to put to you a question I ask every guest I have on the show. And I do this because it's a really great way to get to know someone better and understand their wider philosophy on music generally. I think anybody who's ever picked up a musical instrument and tried to learn it, at some point aspires to be a good musician. But specificity is really important with something like that. You, you kind of have to know what you're aiming at to hit the target and interestingly in all the time i've been doing these interviews not one person has given me the same answer as someone else mm -hmm. it's a very personal thing mm -hmm. so let me ask you laura what does it mean to you to be a good musician hmm i like this question very interesting <laughs> um I've kind of reminded of something that I think I have in one of my practice notebooks that I wrote the other day, but it just made me laugh because I, when I, after I've written it, I thought it was quite funny. 
Um, oh yeah, okay, here it is. It says, never try to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good advice. We can end that discussion. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, never try to be good. <laughs> but yeah, I think I was thinking maybe that was more about like trying to be a good singer or a good guitarist, but also to some degree a good musician, because I think those things sometimes imply, obviously, yeah, like you say, it depends on your definition. But in in my head, maybe my the definitions of those things is quite you know, strict or restricting. And I find actually, if I'm trying to be good, it makes me weird because I'm not thinking about the truth of the matter. I'm trying to be good. Um, yeah. So <laughs> no, I, th I think, I think you've touched on something quite good there because essentially what you're kind of saying is to be a good musician, you have to, it's not just about what your intention is. It's also about accepting what will be in that moment and going with it. Mm. And, and if you, if you are trying to be good, that is a pretty good way of ensuring that you probably won't. Mm. So yeah, I think you have hit on something quite deep there. Actually. I feel like maybe, um, when I was at, studying and stuff, I was very worried about musicality. I know that's not maybe the same thing as being a good musician, but they might be a little bit similar, good musician or musical. And I was so worried about thinking that I'm not musical or am I musical? Am I musical enough? Um, and nowadays I, I don't really worry about that because I think, um, well, firstly, I sort of think in terms of the skill sets, like different skill sets that people have within music, there's just so many different ways that you could be musical or that you could define. Some people are amazing at, I don't know, dictation. Some people are amazing at composing, playing. In a, there's just so many different skills. And if you took somebody who's, for example, a really wonderful um, pianist, who, a classical pianist who has gorgeous phrasing and just not a a uh, dry eye in the audience and then maybe put them in a band that's really really rhythmically tight and crisp and so energizing they might suddenly not quite have that like rhythmic uh crispness and tightness but does that doesn't mean they're not a good musician but it's just a diff i suppose different skill sets applicable to different genres um so maybe sometimes it's kind of finding the area where your own skill set and approach can shine. Um, but also, I think I was worried that I wasn't musical enough because there's a lot of music out there that I truly don't connect with. And that's not because I think it's bad. I think it's great. And I have so much respect for so much types of music. But I actually connect with, with very, very little, worryingly little. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I should admit that. <laughs> and so, And so I was like, does that mean I'm very unmusical because, I mean, why are all these things that people say is like the greatest music of all time and I just don't get it. And also I like, I like my music with other stuff. I like it with words. I like it with pictures. I, I actually like that blending of things. And um, I think I was worried that that meant I wasn't musical enough because I needed other things and that I wasn't, it wasn't enough for me with just the music. Um, so I think I've been so worried about that for so, so much of the time, but now I sort of, I just think, oh, just, you know, everyone's different and go with, <laughs> go with whatever you are. It's interesting you say that because essentially you're talking about how one's temperament can affect um, one's musicianship to a certain extent. And I wonder if, you were saying that you were worried that you didn't connect with many of the, the works that you were being asked to play. Maybe that's something very deep down in you saying that maybe you need to be a composer because maybe that's why you've gravitated towards composition because the music that you're wanting to hear deep down might not exist yet. So it's your responsibility to write it. What do you think to that? I think that is a bit true because I remember um, working on some pieces by 
composers and then I remember saying to my friend at the time this was many years ago I'm really enjoying this all this but I, I kind of wish they'd written the piece that I want to write and then he was like yeah maybe that's just means you should be writing those pieces um and I actually think if I can get it out of my system and do write all the things that I want um not that I'll ever have written them all, but as the more I do that, actually, I then find it a bit easier to connect with the other stuff, probably because that part of me is more fulfilled. Um, so yeah, I think I think there is some truth in definitely in that. Um, and I yeah, I think for me, the the artists that I like, which I suppose might be my own personal definition of good musician, I'm it's not really good, but uh, preferred musician for me <laughs> is um, something where basically I connect with it very, very deeply and I feel like something is going straight from their soul into mine and there's a kind of empathy between us and that it feels really sincere and really true and it makes me feel really intensely emotional in whatever way that's what i like but that's what i like to hear but the what can do that to me is pretty random to be honest this has led me quite neatly to where i'd like to go next because having now heard your thoughts on being a good musician i'd like to explore three aspects of your musicianship your work as a composer your work as an arranger and your work as an interpreter of other people's music. Let's let's take each one in, in its own right. So let's start with your work as a composer. I'd like to start this one with an anecdote, if I may. I remember very vividly the first time I ever saw you perform live. It was in November 2017. And I remember it very vividly for, for four reasons. The first one is it was in the Wigmore Hall, and that's just such a stunning venue to see and hear music in. So it was very special for that reason. The second reason was I remember taking my seat, and it's quite an intimate venue, the Wigmore Hall, even though it's you know it's this gorgeous hall, it's kind of a medium-sized venue. It's it is very intimate, and I remember just looking around, thinking, "Oh, this is going to be lovely," and two rows in front of me. I could see the classical guitarist John Williams <laughs> who'd come to see your concert and I remember thinking wow you know we're, we're in this great venue I'm seeing Laura and John's here wow <laughs> <laughs> so that was the second reason it stuck in my mind the third was obviously to do with your playing it was a sensational concert I, I loved it and I've been a big fan of your work ever since thank you my pleasure it's it's genuinely meant the fourth reason is what I want to talk to you about now. You closed the concert with one of your own compositions. It was the only piece that was your own that you played that night, I believe. I remember it had an electrifying effect on the room. I remember sitting there and we all did it at the same time. It created this kind of really intimate atmosphere where everyone kind of leant forward and listened really intently. The composition involved you both performing and singing. Let's talk about that a little bit. So what inspired that work? And what do you think it is about the human voice that connects with people on such a deep level? Um, I think that particular piece, um, that was actually the first piece I ever wrote, I think, properly for myself to play on guitar because until then um I was uh writing commissions for other people and uh, to be honest I felt this slight sense of shame about the concept of being a guitarist composer because um there was very much this idea around at the when I first started I think that if you compose and play it means you're not as good at them or something uh it kind of devalues your composition style and um so I just felt that it was or yeah I just had a I found it really challenging in the beginning to actually play my own music um 
but that was that piece represents quite a lot because that was the first one that I started doing and originally it was always the encore and then people seemed to like it so then I started putting it in in the main program <laughs> and then I thought oh maybe I put two in in the main program and then now I'm putting more and more um so yeah that was the beginning but the reason why it had the voice in I think I'd just been playing around with some chords and I'd noticed that if I hum uh, if I play a harmonic and hum quietly at the same time, the same pitch as that harmonic, and then I bend my voice, I can create the illusion that the harmonic is bending. So people think that when they first hear that piece, they often think I'm not singing in the beginning because it sounds, they're not sure where the bend is coming from. They're like, that, that they're like oh, I've never heard this pitch bend on the guitar before because it's not actually on the guitar. Um, and so I found that really interesting. Um, and then I think I had been doing a little bit of singing, uh, with my band cause I used to do some backing vocals and I would sometimes sing one or two songs in our concerts by myself, just one or two, cause we had a lead singer who did most of the singing. Um, but I always really loved singing and it's really strange because I'm, yeah, again, coming back to what does it mean to be a good singer? But I, I don't think I'm, I, <laughs> I don't think I'm a good singer in many respects. But um, I really have this strong urge to sing, really strong. So uh, yeah, that's not really answering the question of what do I think, why do people connect with, with singing? But I, I just find certain singers and certain songs so moving and so beautiful. I, I think it's just such a, a glorious thing for people to be able to do. Um, and I, I enjoy singing in so many different contexts. I like the idea of just people singing for fun and people singing in choirs. I just think it's, it's just, a, it's really fun. And it's also something that takes up your whole body in a way. So when you're singing, you often forget your troubles and you feel very present in the moment, I think. That's a really good answer. And. I also love what came out, especially in the early part of your answer, is the composition came from a, a singular concept. And that kind of happened by playing around, you know, just trying things out and, oh, I've noticed this and it kind of led somewhere. And and I love that because I, I, I've said this before on this show, but I think a lot of people have this idea that composition, it's one of those things that you see something incredible and then the whole thing is just revealed to you in all its glory and normally a good composition is not accompanied by the phrase eureka i've done it it's normally, <laughs> it's normally you kind of do something you think that wasn't supposed to happen what was that you know <laughs> do, do, do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah totally yeah definitely that's interesting actually when i was working with julian anderson who's a composer who wrote the piece for the first Julian Bream Trust Wigmore Hall concert that I did in 2015. And his way of working is that he likes to work closely with the performer and he likes to have you try out different bits of the piece as you're going. And so I really realized when we were doing that process, because I'd see a little fragment of an idea the first week and then the next week I'd see it had developed and then, oh, next week it's changed and it's something else now. And I kind of never seen so closely behind the scenes of someone actually writing something because I'd only ever seen me writing something. Um, I still wasn't seeing completely behind the scenes because I wasn't seeing, but I, I was seeing these extracts every week. And somehow I think in my head, I'd had this thought that with classical pieces, they just, yeah, they come to you and they, they come completely fully formed and they could never have been any other way. That's the thing you sort of feel when, when a piece is, so well known imagine asturias or something that the piece that lots of people play on guitar by albanius imagine if that was different it would be really weird because it's just it's just asturias it's like that that the idea that actually along that journey it could probably have taken all these different paths and may well have done in if something had just changed a little bit um so i actually found that really um encouraging to see behind the scenes of that I can imagine. And also, it's interesting you used Astorias as an example there, because I think that actually is a very good piece to illustrate the point you've just made, because there are so many different sections within that you can kind of retrospectively 
if you really look closely, see how that might have unfolded over time as a concept. Mm. It's a it's a wonderful example of exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, it was really interesting to see, actually. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Laura. I, I could talk to you about composition for hours, but I'm, <laughs> I'm very conscious that I can't take up too much of your time. So I'm going to now pivot to talking about your work as an arranger. So I think a starting of an example is probably best. One of my favorite things you've done in recent years was your arrangement of Christmas music for classical guitar. You did In the Bleak Midwinter, Away in a Manger, and my personal favorite, Silent Night. And they're gorgeous. I, I remember as the first time I heard Silent Night, I just, it, it was like, I'm gushing a little bit here, because it, it's because <laughs> I care. It, it had the beauty of how, how simple and gorgeous that melody is. And it kind of, hearing you play it, it's, it's like Christmas has kind of wrapped its arms around you. And it's, it's, it's there, you've captured that feeling in that arrangement. That's really hard to do. M most people when they're arranging often kind of use it as a vehicle to kind of throw everything they've got, including the kitchen sink at it. And what happens is they, the artist, become the kind of the showcase and they forget that the actual beauty of the composition has to come through just as much. And you did it with those pieces. So I'd like to know, firstly, what inspired those wonderful arrangements? And secondly, how do you get that balance right when you're trying to arrange something that isn't normally arranged for solo guitar? Hmm. Woo, thank you. I'm glad you liked them. That's so nice. Yay. I'm very, I'm very into Christmas. So yeah, maybe it's because of my surname, Snowden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> You've been preparing that one, I can tell. <laughs> oh yes, I've had it in my sleeve for many years, been waiting for a chance to use it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I really love um, writing or arranging music for um that's not too hard to play um for either well for anyone but i like the idea of big learner guitarists children um amateur adult guitarists being able to play my pieces i think that's such a beautiful strand of the guitar world because so many people play guitar for fun and it's i think it's such a nice way to be able to connect it's a different way of connection than a concert um and that that just really excites me so much the idea of people being able to enjoy things that i've played or written um in their own homes who aren't necessarily they wouldn't have to be a professional guitarist that's what i think is really cool that it could just be a part of their life um that's something they're doing for fun so i really like that and i'm also i i genuinely love christmas i it's really strange but i actually dream about christmas i think once every two weeks Wow. On, on average. Yeah. And it, they're always just really sweet dreams. Uh, it's like I'm just with my family. Sometimes something goes wrong. Like sometimes I've accidentally ruined Christmas um, by doing something bad. But, <laughs> so those are a little bit tragic. <laughs> and sometimes I'm just very stressed, like, oh, my God, I have to get a present for my sister. I forgot to get a present for my sister or something like that. But yeah, it, 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 I think it's something about Christmas must be deep within my psyche. Um, and I think it's maybe because of the family connection with it um, and just associations. I genuinely find it really beautiful. Um, and so uh, this was in 2020, the dreaded year. And so I wanted to do something, I suppose, that would make me feel like I was um, doing something kind of positive or um, helpful or something. Um, so I decided to do those three arrangements and then I would sell them that month. They would be sold with all the proceeds going to a charity that makes um, kind of Christmas day lunch and uh, a day of activities for care leavers. And I'd heard about that charity because there's one kind of local to where I live. Um, so that was where the whole idea came from. That's really, really beautiful. And 
how did you get the balance right? Because like I said, it, it's they're simple arrangements, but it's not easy to do something simple. I think in music, we often put the words simple and easy together, almost like they mean the same thing. And doing something simple is not easy. How do you get that balance right? Because essentially the, the beauty of the melody and the harmony just sings through, but it's very, it's very you at the same time. Mm. Yeah, I think it would be different if I was trying to arrange a piece of complicated piano music or something. I've never done that type of arrangement. I've always done the just taking a, a melody, a single line melody of folk music or because I have some folk song arrangements as well and three other Christmas ones that are in a similar vein. Um, and so with those, what I'm trying to do is kind of what you've said is I want basically I want the person who plays it to be able to express themselves in the melody. And I find that a lot of the time, if you have too much um, fancy chords or stuff, it becomes too clunky, basically. So sure, maybe if you're super advanced and you have this incredible technique, you can still make that really sing and be smooth. But mostly it would just end up sounding like very detached. So I'm trying to find a way for it to sound basically that you can express yourself and you can play it in your own way. Um, and for that, I like to make use, I, I spend quite a lot of time finding a good key. Um, so I try it in a few different keys and I'm basically just listening out for the resonance in the different keys and which one seems to resonate and feel and sound easiest. <laughs> so I'm just like, if it ends up going too high, I don't want it. If, it's just, <laughs> what, yeah, I'm trying to find what feels really nice under the fingers. And then with the chords, I'm trying to basically pepper the harmonies with little nice notes, usually just maybe a seventh or something or like a in a minor chord, a minor seventh or just one little dissonance like a say it's a chord and you've got note one and five and I add note number two or note number four or something and just simple things like that. And those chords, I usually would want them to have at least one open string in them. So it just resonates really nicely. And so I'm really just trying to find where can I find those simple chords that are easy to play, that feel nice and feel very, very resonant. Um, but there could be a little bit of tastiness in it because if it's too um, just really, really regular chords, I might find it not quite tasty enough. So. I think it's that it's really about resonance in the end. And I do try quite a few different ways of doing it and different um, alternatives, trying to find the most uh, tasty and resonant one. That makes a lot of sense, because essentially there's kind of three elements there, isn't there? There's the kind of ergonomic nature. How easy is it to fall under the fingers? Mm. There's the, for want of a better phrase, it's a very unmusical term, but the vibe of it is more mm. important than the virtuosity, if that makes sense. Mm. And it kind of struck me that it kind of sounds like you're thinking very much from a horizontal perspective in terms of melody rather than a vertical perspective mm. in terms of harmony. Is yeah, it that? is. Yeah, I would say that's very fair. Yeah, I think I'm thinking, how could you play this melody in a way that will feel nicer? Even sometimes like, oh, we're going to slide up on this note because that feels nice. And then the rest has to kind of fit around it. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Laura. There's some amazing things that people can take away and learn from there. I'd now like to talk about one other aspect of your musicianship that we've not gone into too much detail with yet. Being a classical guitarist, you do have to interpret other people's music as well as compose your own and arrange your own. I'd like to dig into this a little bit because it's not easy on the one hand, having to be respectful of what someone else wanted in their music, but at the same time, find your voice within it. It's often easy to think of those as polar opposites, you know, mm -hmm. citadels whose doors are firmly closed to one another. What tips would you offer people who struggle with that? Hmm. It's difficult because in a funny kind of way, this almost relates to what we were saying earlier about um, when you're 
trying to find your unique voice. This is in terms of your general artistry or your composing or whatever. Um, and if you're trying to be unique, uh, sometimes that might not go so well as if you just really deeply try to be yourself. But in a funny kind of way, I think maybe it's a bit similar with uh, interpretation, because if you're in a kind of open creative state of mind with the piece and you're looking at it and thinking, what is this saying to me? What do I think this is all about? What is the feeling of it? Um, what, yeah, what do I think the music is trying to say? And then you're responding to that really honestly and kind of openly and creative that will probably automatically be in your own unique voice um in fact sometimes probably might be a lot more unique and strange than you would have hoped <laughs> because sometimes you know some very interesting artists here you hear versions of things that are really quite different sometimes and sometimes i think oh that actually really works and I, it's not necessarily people then get all angry in the youtube comments being like why do you have to do it differently everybody's done it like this for millions of years but actually they might not be trying to be different that might just be their actual response um that's not practical advice at all but that was just a general thought <laughs> No, I, 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 th I think it is. And it's, it's very much in keeping with many of the things we've discussed about about authenticity and that concept of, again, it comes back to accepting what your inner voice is telling you as opposed to go, going out and kind of searching for it in the wilderness. Mm. And it, that's come up quite a few times throughout the conversation and it definitely came out there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, I think for sure, um, I mean, people have such different approaches when it comes to interpretation, I think. And I think Julian was quite instinctive about things. I think he had, for sh he'd listened to a lot of music, I think, and he had probably, and he'd worked with a lot of really brilliant musicians. I think that also helps a lot because if you work with people who you think are very brilliant and sincere interpreters i think some of that rubs off on you as well i think he talked about how his work with the singer peter pierce had really helped him maybe that had helped him with the singingness of the phrasing that we've talked about um but i've lost my train of thought entirely <laughs> what was i on about <laughs> i was like why am i talking about peter pierce <laughs> we were talking about kind of accepting your inner voice finding yourself and kind of being true to what you're listening to and what you're what you're wanting to express really yeah yeah okay yeah yeah because i guess i was thinking that um yeah people have lots of different ways of it, 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 it being true to what you're wanting to express um i think is really important but then i suppose also widening your musical palette and thought and knowledge is probably always useful i mean i definitely still have a lot more that I could could learn and do on that front. Um, there's some quite interesting teachers out there these days who um, work with a, a sort of improvisatory approach to classical music, where, for example, you might look, let's say, to, uh, as a maybe simple example would be they might take a Bach prelude that has quite clear kind of it's this chord in this bar, this chord in this bar ish, and then you might then perhaps one person plays the piece as is, and the other person improvises a line that goes uh, around, that works with that chord structure. Or maybe you do some improvisation of your own, on your own, based on that basic chord progression, but you kind of make it go your own way. And I think the idea is to give yourself a uh, internal feeling for what those chords feel like because in a way with when it comes to analysis i think analyzing things can be really great but at the same time if you're literally just going this chord this this chord then this chord then this chord it's a bit like what does that even mean i mean does it is it useful to know that maybe but this is more of a what does that chord actually feel like uh you know this one's very dissonant and clashing this one is more 
uh, relaxed or whatever, whatever and, and then it gives you more sense of the direction, like where are the chords going, where is where are the harmonies going. I think you raise a great point there, and you're right, because it's one thing to, on a kind of cerebral and intellectual level, understand the concept behind the theory underpinning something you're trying to interpret, but it's a very different beast actually knowing it there. Mm. It I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of, I think there are some teachers who work in that way. Um, I've, I, I know uh, I'm saying it in such a kind of, uh, they would obviously explain it way better, but <laughs> this is um, uh, like, for example, Jonathan Neathwood, a teacher in America, a guitarist and teacher. He's utterly brilliant and his teaching method is really, really wonderful. And he's such a unbelievably uh, knowledgeable um, musician who, with a tremendous um, ability to analyze and understand the music, but he's also able to connect it um, brilliantly to help people feel like, what does that actually feel like for me? What does that mean mean for me? Um, so it's not just like, woo, what does this feel like? Kind of with no context at all, but it is actually transforming it into uh, ultimately, what does your voice tell you to do about it? I suppose it could be you could do that same kind of work with a rhythm as well. It could be that you take a, a rhythmical idea that's in your piece and then you try to get really into the groove of that rhythm and you try the rhythm out in different ways and different places on the guitar. So that rhythmic feel gets really embedded um, inside you. Um, and I think I think I do quite a lot of work with um, maybe in my imagination. Uh, creating pictures in my mind of it could be simple things like Julian would often talk about how music rises and falls. And um, so it was often say something's rising. Is it a sense of aspiration? Is it a sense of hope? Is it a sense of excitement? So something that's doing something could have so many different feelings inside it or something that's falling is it sort of melancholy is it weary is it resigned um so i'm probably often trying to think about the the feeling of each little gesture and idea and um yeah kind of pinpoint that feeling and sometimes also maybe in in with pictures in my mind like is this fade to black is it like a sudden jump cut is it, oh, this idea comes from somewhere really far away? Is it, I'm seeing this something from the past? I'm seeing this through a window, you know? <laughs> so it's like things that can bring, uh, make your imagination more fertile. And um, that kind of imagination training, I think, helps then the playing to feel more alive. I love that. And and I'm just going to riff on what you said a little bit there, because it put me in mind, one of the most interesting workshops I ever attended, I went to a an acting workshop, I'm not, I'm not in any way involved with acting, but I, I just went for fun. And it was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen, because they did a whole two hour workshop on one stage direction, they didn't do any speaking, the stage direction was David picks up the glass. And the objective is how many different ways can David pick up the glass and what does that tell you about how David feels and what mm -hmm. does that tell you about the rest of the story mm -hmm. and and it was amazing I, I remember watching it and I just thought there's so many parallels to how we think about music and what you guys are doing here and you echoed them in your response then and I loved that oh that's really interesting about that workshop that sounds really cool yeah I think a lot of my um method for um uh, interpreting music came from a book about acting, Stanislavski, An Actor Prepares. I think I, I had quite a different approach, I think, actually. And then when I read that book, uh, and it, it talks about, yeah, this kind of imagination training and sort of the intention behind things um, and living things afresh in the moment. Um, and that really changed things. Like, for example, I think he had this I probably completely misremembered it now. It just it's, <laughs> it's just become something completely different in my mind. But I think there was an example of someone who um, they had to play a character. They were practicing it at home, and then suddenly they had this flash of inspiration, and they did something really cool. 
And then they were thinking, okay, great, what did I do? So I raised my voice and I moved over my arm like this and I looked up here, whatever it was that they did. Um, and then they went back to class and they tried to replicate the things that they'd done. I moved my arm like this and I spoke louder and I uh, looked over there, but they'd sort of lost the original um, impetus and reason for why they'd done it in the first place. And so I guess I'm kind of thinking in a similar way in my music, if I'm playing a piece, if I'm doing, okay, I'm going to get louder here because it has a sense of um, excitement. I'm trying to focus a bit more on the sense of excitement rather than the get louder, which is the same as how Julian taught me, I think, because he would have said, well, this, you know, is it's very exciting. So why don't you just um, have a nice big crescendo and get louder? And then when you're at home, you maybe think more about the exciting and you focus less on the crescendo. And it might even be that for you, actually, at the end, crescendo isn't going to be the way to express that exciting. It might be different, but you remember the exciting part. Whereas if you're just receiving a list of instructions, go uh, crescendo here, staccato here, then it sort of doesn't have so much context. Absolutely. You can't, um, you can't turn an inspirational process into a machine-like process. Mm. That's exactly what you mean. Mm. Again, I could talk to you about this for hours, Laura, but I'd like to pivot to an area of the discussion I've really been looking forward to. I often say on Talking Music, from a health point of view, to a certain extent, we are what we eat. From a musical point of view, to a certain extent, we are what we listen to. With this in mind, who would you say are the guitarists that have most inspired you and why? Crucially, you don't just have to pick classical players. Do feel free to cast your nets as wide as you like. Cool. Okay. I think um, Pavel Steidl, I know I've referenced him a couple of times, but it was just extraordinary to see him play. I, it, it just feels like he's not even, you just forget that it's a guitar. You forget, you forget that it's music. You, you're just completely transported. And he's playing pieces that are not even necessarily of the style that I'm even most interested in always. Um, but it just doesn't matter what he does. It's just incredible. It's so moving and expressive and every note counts. Every note is poetry. It's really wonderful. Not to mention the whole presentation style, I think is just gorgeous as well. Um, so I think that's, he's really had a very profound effect on me. Um, and I, I had just a few lessons with him um, and, and they as well. I felt that they really um, shaped what I'm doing. And I mean, there's so much more to learn. I could go back and it, it, yeah, and just keep learning from him forever. But even this, that handful of sessions I had were already, that's what I'm saying, they already made such a difference. And that was, I've only had a few. So to think how, yeah, all the things that must be inside of him. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, and recently I discovered a really nice classical guitarist from the olden days um, called Louise Walker. Um, and it was a recording of her playing a piece by Tariga, uh, sorry, a piece by Chopin, which had been arranged by Tariga, the uh, Spanish guitarist Tariga. And um, her playing was so, um, again, so poetic, so much feeling, and kind of nuance and subtlety and lyricism and yeah it was just glorious and that inspired me to play that piece that um she was playing on there um so i think yeah those are two particularly that come to mind right now what's really striking there is you've you've both experiences are essentially moments where the player you're describing transcended the instrument they were playing Mm. Um, to, to, to a certain extent, they, yes, they are a guitarist, but you were talking about them very much as, as a musician who happens to express through the guitar, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and, and I loved how that came out in your answer, because they are often the musicians that inspire us the most. I, I remember I used an example recently where 
when we think of Miles Davis, the great jazz musician, we don't necessarily think of him as a trumpet player. Um, mm -hmm. He's kind of in a in in this kind of different world of mists and spirits in the same way that you, you wouldn't call Michelangelo an interior decorator. Do, do, mm. do you know what, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I liked how that kind of came out in your answer. You, you were talking in those ways that transcended the instrument. That was beautiful. Oh, yeah, I think that is something I really like to hear, actually, because I'm thinking now of another guitarist as well, who I've also mentioned, um, Jonathan Leithwood, I mentioned him earlier. Um, but he gave uh, the concert at Wigmore Hall for the Julian Bream Trust in, um, I can't remember when, but maybe 2013 or something like that, or, or maybe earlier, actually, 2011, maybe. Um, and it, it's just such sensational, expressive, um, I mean, it's just so committed and everything has such a sense of direction and purpose. So it keeps you hooked on every single note. And I remember he played 12 um, studies by Villa Lobos. It's a set of 12 studies and they're very hard. I mean, ridiculously hard, really, and especially to play all 12. And I think a lot of the time, if you'd hear those 12 studies, it could sound a little bit mechanical almost because they are kind of studies that the creativity and colour and life he brought to them was extraordinary. Um, and I think that was actually one of my favourite parts of the concert, even though um, it seemed almost quite an extreme thing to be playing. Again, I could talk to you about this for hours, Laura, but I'm very conscious we're pretty much at the end of our interview time now. Before I ask my last question, though, Actually, I'm going to put one more in, if I may. Yeah, don't worry. I, I, I have time. I mean, if you're worried about people uh, sitting through the whole thing, I understand that concern, but um, I have time, so don't worry about that. I don't think anyone's going to be tuning out. This is fascinating stuff you're talking about. I've been weighing up whether or not to put this question to you, because it's a really difficult one, for, well, for two reasons. One, it's kind of a hypothetical question, and no one ever likes to answer a hypothetical. And two, it's kind of one of those counterfactual questions, you know, one of those kind of what if sort of things. But I'm going to go for it in the spirit of being that awkward person who asks awkward questions. Yay, awkward, awkward. <laughs> <laughs> With that in mind, here we go. And thank you for the chant as well. Yeah. I <laughs> You're such a natural musician. It's hard to imagine you not being a musician. But had you not become one, what do you think you'd have been? I really wanted to be an actor. Um, that's what I wanted to do. Not this music nonsense, but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, um, I am happy that I've gone down the music route because I also think that in a way it's actually quite interesting to be able to apply my desires from outside of music onto the music and maybe that actually makes things more interesting um and uh i've also just enjoyed the experience of i like musicians i think i love and i've got so many brilliant friends from it um and so i i really enjoy and, that, and there's also aspects of just the type of work that you could do and the variety and writing for people playing concerts and things um, but I was very, very interested in acting, um, but I didn't seem to be, um, I suppose with music, I was um, sort of like, say, when you when you play at school or whatever, and then the teachers are like, oh, yeah, good playing, you can be in the concert. But for, for, for acting, that that wasn't necessarily what was happening to me. So it wasn't like, oh, yeah, great acting. You can have the lead role. So I suppose that kind of made me think, oh, maybe I don't have um, the kind of really the ability for this. Um, I'm not sure because I think I do think it. Hopefully, if you practice something enough, you could actually become skilled at it. But I suppose I already had a bit of a head start with music because I actually seemed to have some kind of feel for it, whereas maybe with acting it would have been, uh, I would have been very behind or something. I, I mean, I don't suppose I would have even got into an acting school, so I probably would have had to spend several years already just trying to 
get into a school, then maybe never got into a school, then give up. So I don't really know what would have happened. <laughs> but oh, who knows, maybe I would have become improved really much and become good. But I, I, I just don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I actually have started going to acting classes recently. Um, yeah, and I'm really enjoying it, actually. So uh, I think that's really fun. Well, that's marvellous. I, I was going to ask if you were if you were still doing acting, and for what it's worth, I'm very glad you became a musician. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and, I, and I don't say that in a disrespectful way to your acting. I'm sure. <laughs> I love your playing more. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad I became a musician as well. <laughs> Before I ask my final question, Laura. If people have been listening to what you've been saying today and have enjoyed it and want to find out more about what you're doing, where's the best place for them to find you online? Um, I have a website, laurasnowden.co.uk. Um, I have a YouTube channel um, where I, yes, post things sporadically. I'm trying to do more. And I think I use, I use Facebook a little bit, mostly Instagram, Laura Snowden Guitar. So those are probably the three main ones. I'd like to close with a question I always like to finish with. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. If you could go back in time and offer your younger self, the young musician, Laura Snowden, I'm going to do the one piece of advice thing again. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I may let, let you have two. <laughs> what advice would you give? Oh, the thing is, even if I did, I don't know that I would take the advice. And probably I probably already had all the advice, but just didn't get it or whatever. So um, I th think feel that I will I will say something, but I'm just saying as a disclaimer, I do think you kind of end up learning things through the actual experience. So uh, having a piece of advice may not necessarily help, um, especially if it came from me. Because I'd be like, well, what do you know? But <laughs> I might say, uh, I'd probably say maybe go to therapy earlier <laughs> and go to physiotherapy earlier. Because with physiotherapy, because I'm hypermobile, I have very bendy joints like my arms. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that was made particularly disturbing by the camera angle, I think. But, um, <laughs> but um, I think uh, I, yeah, so I had quite a lot of random pains in random places all over my body, not, not necessarily in relation to playing the guitar, but just in general. And um, I think in 2018, I sort of realized that uh, due to hypermobility and so actually doing physio to strengthen the muscles is really useful. Um, and I, yeah, I have, I don't have much of a history of sports because I was never sporty yet. Well, unfortunately, sport at school was quite a traumatic experience. Um, <laughs> yes, I won't get into those stories. Um, and so um, now, you know, as a grown up, I'm trying to do all this physiotherapy and go swimming and stuff to try and strengthen. But I suppose it would have been maybe useful to have done that earlier because I think it would have probably been useful for my playing, but also just for my general um, well being. So I think that could be quite a practical piece of advice that I could have done um, that wouldn't, that, you know, because that's not something you have to learn by experience necessarily. You could just do the advice and it would be better. I think those are wise words to end on. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Laura Snowden, thank you for coming on the show and talking music. Yay, thank you for having me.